control over it. Mm. In that TED talk, you really discussed the idea whether um, AI, when it gets to a certain point of sentience and intelligence, will will wreak havoc on humanity. Mm. Six years later, where do you stand on, on it today? Do you think, are you optimistic about our chances of survive, survival? Yeah, I mean, I can't say I'm optimistic. I'm, I am worried about two species of problem here that are related. I mean, there's, there's sort of the near-term problem of just what humans do with increasingly powerful AI and um, how it amplifies the, the problem of misinformation and disinformation and make, it just makes it harder and harder to make sense of reality together. Um, and then there's just the, the longer term concern about you know, what's called alignment with, with artificial general intelligence, where we build AI that is, is truly general and you know, by definition superhuman in its competence and power. And then the question is, have we built it in such a way that is aligned in a, in a durable way with, with our interests? And um, I mean, there's some people who just don't see this problem and that they're kind of blind to it. When I'm in the presence of someone who doesn't have, doesn't share this intuition, they, they don't resonate to it. I just don't understand what they're doing or not doing with their minds in that moment. Let's say I'm wrong about that. Well, then, you know, it's just the other person's right. And so we just we just have fundamentally different intuitions about, about this particular point. And the point is this. If you're imagining building true artificial general intelligence that is superhuman, and that is what everyone, whatever their intuitions, purports to be imagining. You know, there's, there's, you know, the people on both sides of the, of the alignment debate the people who think alignment's a real problem and, or, and people think it's a total fiction. But everyone, you know, virtually everyone who's party to this conversation agrees that we will ultimately build artificial general intelligence that will be superhuman in its, in its capacities. And there's very little you have to assume to be confident that, that we're going to do that. It's really just two assumptions. One is that intelligence is substrate independent. Right? There's no, it doesn't have to be made of meat it can be made in silico, right? And we've already proven that with narrow AI. I mean, it's just, it's, we obviously have intelligent machines. And, you know, your calculator in your phone is better than you are at arithmetic. And it's just, that's, that's some very narrow band of intelligence. So as we keep building intelligent machines on the assumption that there's nothing magical about having a computer made of meat, the only other thing you have to assume is that we will keep doing this. We will keep making progress, and eventually we will we will be in the presence of something more intelligent than we are. And that's not assuming Moore's law. It's not assuming exponential progress. It's just, we just we just have to keep going, right? And when you look at the reasons why we wouldn't keep going, those are all just terrifying, right? Because intelligence is so valuable, and we're so incentivized to have more of it. And every increment of it is is valuable. It's not like it only gets valuable when you get, you know, when you double it or, or 10 X it. No, no, if you just get three more percent, right, that's, that's, uh, that pays for itself. Um, so we're going to keep doing this. Our failure to do it suggests that something terrible has happened in the meantime, right? We've had a world war. We've had a global pandemic far worse than COVID. We got hit by an asteroid. Something happened that prevented us as a species from continuing to make progress in building intelligent machines. Right. So absent that, we're going to keep going. We will eventually be in the presence of something smarter than we are. And this is where intuitions divide. My intuition, and it's shared by, by um, many people, I'm sure, and I know at least one who you've spoken to, my intuition is that there is something inherently dangerous or the dumber party in that relationship. There's, there's something inherently dangerous for the dumber species to be in, pre in the presence of the smarter species. And we have seen this you know, based on our entanglement with all other species, dumber than we are, right? less competent than we are. Um, and 
by so by reasoning by analogy, it would be true of something smarter than, than we are. Um, people imagine that because we have built these machines, that is no longer true. Right? But and here's where my intuition goes from there. That is that imagination is born of not taking intelligence seriously. Right? Because what intelligence is, is a, a mismatch in intelligence in particular, is a, a fundamental lack of insight into what the smarter party is doing and why it's doing it and what it will do next on the part of the dumber party. Mm -hmm. right? So I mean, you just can imagine that, by analogy, just imagine that the dogs had invented us as their their super intelligent AIs, right? Uh, for the purpose of making their lives better, you know, just securing resources for them, securing comfort for them, making getting them medical attention. Um, it's been working out pretty well for the dogs for about ten thousand years, right? I mean, there's some exceptions. We've got we mistreat certain dogs, but generally speaking, for most dogs, most of the time, humans have been a great invention. Right. Now, it's true that the, the mismatch in our intelligence dictates a, a, a fundamental blindness with respect to what we've become in the meantime. Right? So like, we have all these instrumental goals and things we care about that they cannot possibly conceive. Right? They know that when we go get the leash and say it's time for a walk, they understand that particular part of the language game. But everything else we do when we're talking to each other, and when, we're, when we're on our computers or on our phones, they don't have the dimmest idea of what we're up to. And if we ever, if, if something happened, if we, I mean, we love, the truth is we love our dogs. We make just irrational sacrifices for our dogs. We prioritize their health over all kinds of things that is just amazing to consider. And yet, if we learned, if there was a new you know, global pandemic kicking off and some xenovirus was jumping from dogs to humans and it was just kind of super Ebola, right? It was just, it was 90% lethal and it was, this was just a forced choice between them. I mean, what, what do you value more? Your, the, the lives of your dogs or the lives of your kids, right? If that's, if that's a situation we were in, it's totally conceivable. I mean, it's, it's not a, not, by, by no means impossible. We would just kill all the dogs right? and they would never know why, right? We would just, and it's because we have this layer of, of mind and culture and, and just, just the, the, the new sphere, right? There's just this, this realm of, of, of mind that requires a requisite level of intelligence to even be party to, to even know exists, that they have, they have no idea it exists, right? And it's, so this is a fanciful, uh, analogy because the dogs did not invent us, but evolution invented us, right? Evolution has coded us, you know, as I said, to survive and spawn, and that's it, right? So evolution can't see everything else we've done with our time and attention and, and all the values we've formed in the meantime, and all the ways in which we have explicitly disavowed the program we've been given, right? So evolution gave us a program but if we were really going to live by the lights of that program, what would we be doing? I mean, we would be having as many kids as possible, right? And, you know, the, the guys would be going to sperm banks and donating their sperm and finding that, like, the best use of their time and attention. I mean, it's like the idea that you could have hundreds of kids for which you have no financial responsibility, that, would be the, that should be the most rewarding thing that you could possibly do with your time uh, as a man. And yet, that's obviously not what we do. And there are people who decide not to have kids. And there are people who, and, and yet, and everything else we do, from you know, having podcast conversations like this to, to curing diseases, to I mean, just like literally everything we're doing with, our, you know, with science, with, with culture, is yes, there are points of contact. But between those those products and our evolved capacities, right? like it's not it's not just that it's not magic, right? We are social primates that that have leveraged certain ancient hardware to do new things. 
But evolution, the code that we've been given doesn't see any of that, right? And we've not been optimized to build democracies, right? Um, evolution knows nothing. It can know nothing. If evolution were a coder, there's just no, there's no democracy maximization in that code, right? It's just, it's not a, it's, it's just not there. So the idea that these things will stay aligned with us because we have built them, because if we have this origin story, that we gave them their initial code, and yet we gave them a capacity to rewrite their code and build future generations of themselves, right? Um, there's just no reason to believe that. I see no, and, and, the, and the mismatch in intelligence is intrinsically dangerous. And you could see this by, I mean, Stuart Russell. I don't know if you had him on the podcast. He's a great um, professor of computer science at Berkeley. And he wrote, literally co-wrote one of the, the most popular textbooks on AI. Um, I mean, he has some arresting analogies, which I think are good intuition pumps here. Um, and one is just think of how you would feel if you knew, like, let's we got a, a communication from elsewhere in the galaxy. And it was a message that we decoded and it said, people of Earth, we will arrive on your lowly planet in 50 years. Get ready. Right. That, it, it, anyone who thinks that we're going to get super intelligent AI in, let's say, 50 years, thinks we're, we're essentially in that situation. And yet we're not responding emotionally do it in the same way. If we, if we received a communication from a, a, a species that we knew just by, by, fact, by the sheer fact that they were communicating with us in this way, we knew they're more competent and more powerful and more intelligent than we are, right? And they're going to arrive. We would, we would feel that we were on the threshold of the most momentous change in the history of, of our species. And we would feel, but most importantly, we would feel that it's because this is a, 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 a relationship, an unavoidable relationship that's being foisted upon us, right? It's like, we, like so, a, a, a new creature is coming into the room, right, with its own capacities, and now you're in relationship. And, wh and one thing is absolutely certain, it is smarter than you are, right? By, by what factor? Ultimately, we're talking about by, by factors, you know, just by so many orders of magnitude, it's, it, our intuitions completely fail. I mean, even if, even if it was just a difference in, in the time of processing, even if it, well, let's, let's say there was no difference in, in, in the actual native intelligence, but it's just processing speed, a million fold difference in processing speed is, is just a phantasmagorical difference in capacity. So just, like, just imagine we had 10 smart guys in a room over there and they were working and thinking and talking a million times faster than we are, right? Well, so they're, they're no smarter than we are, but they're just faster. And we talk to them once every two weeks just to catch up on you know what they're up to and what they want to do and whether they still want to collaborate with us. Well, two weeks for us is 20,000 years of analogous progress for them. Right, so how could, you, how could we possibly hope to constrain the opinions and, and collaborate with and negotiate with people just no smarter than ourselves who are making 20,000 years of progress every time we make two weeks of progress? Right, it's just, it, it's, it's unimaginable. And yet there are many people who don't, they just think this is just fiction. Everything I all all the noises I've made in the last five minutes are just like a, a a new religion of fear, right? And it's just, there's no reason to think that alignment is even a potential problem. If your intuition is correct, and that analogy of us getting a signal from outer space that someone is coming in 30 years, which by the way, a lot of people that speak on this subject matter um, don't believe it's even going to be 30 years yeah, until we yeah. reach that sort of singularity moment, I think they speak of or artificial general intelligence. I've heard people like Elon say, you know, many fewer decades, 10, 10 years, 15 years, right. 20 years, etc. If that is correct, then surely this is the most pressing challenge, conversation, issue of our time. And there's no logical reason that I can see to 
refute your intuition that I, I can't see a logical reason the, the rate of progress will, will continue don't necessarily see anything that will wipe out or pause our rate of progress um let me, let me just to, to uh be charitable to the other side here there are other assumptions that they smuggle in that they some people are, I mean, some do it without being aware of it but some actually believe these assumptions and this spells the difference on on this on this uh, particular intuition um so, so it's possible to assume that the more intelligent you get the more ethical you become by definition right now and we might you know draw a somewhat more equivocal picture from just the human case where we see that well, oh, there's some very smart people who aren't that ethical but there I, I believe there are people and I've talked to a few at least a few people who believe this there are people who assume that kind of in the limit as you push out into just just far beyond human levels of intelligence there's every reason to believe that all of the the provincial creaturely failures of human ethics will be left behind as well it's like you're not like the, the, the selfishness and the and the and the basis for conflict like like these are not gonna, the apish urges of you know status seeking uh, monkeys is is just not it's not going to be in the code, and as you push out into into just kind of the omnibus genius of, of the coming AI, you're going to there's, there's a kind of a, a sainthood that's going to come along with it, right? And, and and a wisdom that will come along with it. Now, I just think that's a that's quite a gamble. I I, th I think I would take the other the other side of that bet, and and I would frame it this way: there has to be ways in, in the space of all possible intelligences that are beyond the human, right? There's got to be more than one possible. It's got to be it's just like there's many different ways to have a chess engine that's better than I am at chess. They're still, they're, they're different from each other, but they're all better than me, right? Um, there's got to be more than one way to have a superhuman artificial intelligence. And I would, I would imagine there, there are not, not, infinite number of ways but just a vast number of in the space of all possible minds there are many locations in that space beyond the human that are not aligned with human well-being right? there's got to be more ways to build this unaligned than aligned right and what other people are smuggling into this conversation is the intuition that no no once you get beyond the human it's just going to get. It's just you're going to be in the presence of you know just the Buddha who understands quantum mechanics and oncology and everything else, right? I just see no reason to think that that's so. And we we could build something that is again taking intelligence seriously. We're going to build something that we're in relationship to. It's really intelligent in all the ways that we're intelligent. It's just better at all of those things than we are. It's by definition superhuman because. The only way it wouldn't be superhuman, the only way it would be human level, even for 15 minutes, is if we didn't let it improve itself, if we wanted to just keep it stuck at, you know, at a, we, we built a, a college undergraduate, and we wanted just to keep it stuck there. But we would have to dumb down all of the specific capacities we've already built, right? Just like all, every AI we have, narrow AI, is superhuman for the thing it does. You know, it's it's... It has access to all the information on the internet, right? It's, it's just like, it's got perfect memory. It can perfectly copy itself. When one part of the system learns something, the rest of the system learns it because it just can swap files, right? It can, it's, um, you're, again, your, your phone is a, is, a, is a superhuman calculator. There's no reason to make it a, a, a calculator that is human level. Um, and so we're never gonna do that. We're never gonna be in the presence of human AGI. We will, we will be, immediately in the presence of superhuman AGI and then the question is how quickly it, it improves and how far there how much headroom is there to improve into um, on the assumption that you can get quite a bit more intelligent than we are right that there's like that we're nowhere near the summit of possible intelligence you have to imagine that you're going to be in the presence of something that is again it could be completely unconscious, right? This is, I'm not saying that there's something that's like to be this thing, although there might be. That's a totally different problem that's worth worrying about. 
but whether conscious or not, it is solving problems, detecting problems, improving its capacity to do all of that in ways that we can't possibly understand. And the products of its increasing competence are always being surfaced, right? So it's like it's we've been we've been using it to change the world. We became we've, we've become reliant upon it. We built this thing for a reason. I mean, one thing that's been amazing about the developments in recent months is that those of us who have been at all cognizant of the AI safety space for you know, now going on a decade or more for some people always assumed that as we got closer to the end zone we'd become that the labs would become more circumspect we'd be building this stuff air gap from the internet you know it's like we have this phrase air gap from the internet like we thought this was a thing like you, you, this thing would be in a box and then the question would be well do we let it out of the box and let it do something right like is it safe and how do we know if it's safe Right? And we thought we would have that moment. We thought it would, it would happen in a lab at Google or at Facebook or somewhere. We thought we would hear, okay, we've got something really impressive, and now we just want it to touch the stock market. We want it to touch you know, the, our, our medical data, or we just want to see if we can use it. We're way past that. Right? We've built this stuff already in the wild. It's already connected to the Internet. It's already got millions of people using it. It already has APIs. It's already, I mean, it's, it's already doing work. So that, I mean, from an AI safety point of view, that's it's amazing. Like we didn't even have the moment, the choice point we thought was going to be so fraught. Of course, right. we didn't. We we because there was such pressing incentives for people to press forward regardless of that conversation. Especially, but yeah, every, but everyone everyone thought. I mean, I, I was never. I was. I don't believe I was ever in conversation with someone with someone like Eliezer Yudkowsky or, or uh, Nick Bostrom or Stuart Russell who assumed we would be in this spot like I just everyone we because yeah I, you know, I'd have to go back and look at those conversations but there was so much time spent you know it seems quite unnecessarily on this idea that circumspect we'd make a certain amount of progress and circumspection would kick in like even the people who were who were doubters would become worried and at there and there would be like in the final yards you know as we go cross into the end zone there'd be some mode where we could sort of slow down and figure it out and try like try to deal with the arms race dynamics like let's place a phone call to china and 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 just like let's let's talk about this we got something interesting but the stuff is already being built in connection to everything. And there's already just endless businesses being, being uh, devised on, the, on the, the back of this thing. And all the improvements are going to get plowed into it. And so just imagine what this looks like even in, su in success, right? Like, let's say it just starts working wonders for us. And we just we get these great productivity gains. And OK. So then we cross into the into the you know, whatever the singularity is, right? At whatever speed we find ourselves in the presence of something that is truly general. After all of this stuff is all of this narrow stuff, uh, albeit superhuman narrow stuff, is is something that we totally depend on, right? Like every hospital mm -hmm. requires it, and every air, airplane requires it, and all of our missile systems require it, and it's we're just this is the way we do business. Um, there is no, there's, there's nothing to turn off at that point. I, mean, I just don't, you know, it's like, I guess, I mean, I put this to Mark Andreessen on my podcast, and he said, yeah, you can turn off the internet. And I, mean, I don't, I can't believe he was quite serious. I mean, yes, if you're North Korea, I guess you can turn off the internet for North Korea, and that's why North Korea is like North Korea. But the idea that we could, get, I mean, just the cost of turning off the internet n now would be. Uh, I think it would be unimaginable in, in, the, in, the, in the economic just the economic cost alone the, it, it just would be um, so anyway I mean just the, the, the idea that we've, we've lost the moment to decide whether to hook our most powerful AI to everything uh, because it's already being built more or less in contact with if not everything 
many, so many things that you just can't put the genie back in the bottle. That's, that is genuinely surprising to me. And um, yeah, I mean, incentives. Is, is, this not the, is this not the most pressing problem though? Because I, I, I was going to ask start this conversation by asking you the question about the thing that occupies your mind the most and the most important thing we should be talking about. And I, I in part assume the answer would be artificial intelligence because the way that you talk mm. about your intuition on this subject matter, you've got children. Yeah. You think about the future a lot. Um, if you can see this species coming to Earth in the next, even if it's in the next 100 years, um, it strikes me to be the, the most pressing problem for humanity. Well, I do. I'm as, as interesting as I think that problem is and, and consequential as it is. I'm I'm worried that, that life could become unlivable in the near term before we even get there. Like, I'm just worried about the, the misuses of narrow AI in the meantime. Just I'm worried about I mean, just just take the, the current level of AI we have. You know, we have GPT-4. I, I think within the next 12 months or two years, and let's say, let's say we, whatever GPT-5 is, we're going to be in the presence of something where most of what's online that purports to be information could soon be fake, right? Where like just most of the text you find on any topic is just fake, right? Like someone has just decided write me a thousand journal articles on why mRNA vaccines cause cancer. You give me, you know, 150 citations, write them in the, in the style of nature and nature genetics and Lancet and JAMA and, and, just, put, them. and just put them out there, right? right? One teenager could do that in five minutes with the right AI, right? It's like, it's just like the, we're not, GPT-4 is not quite that, but GPT-5 you know, possibly will be that. I mean, it's like that, that is such a near-term advance. Right, or get, you know, just when you imagine knitting together the visual stuff like Mid Journey and Dolly um, and Stable Diffusion with, with a large language model, just imagine the tool. Again, this is maybe this is 18 months away, maybe it's three years away, but it's not 30 years away. The tool which said, where you can just say, give me a 45 minute documentary on how the Holocaust never happened, filled with archival imagery, give me, you know, Hitler speaking in German and with the, with the appropriate translations and um, give, it, you know, give it in the style of Alex Gibney or Ken Burns or and give me a, a 10,000 of those right like that like that's all all the friction for misinformation has been taken out of the system and yeah I worry we're just going to have to declare bankruptcy with respect to the internet like just well, like we just are not going to be able to figure out what's real and when you when you look at how hard that is now with social media uh in the in the aftermath of, of covid and trump and how it just the challenge for, of, of holding an election that most of the population agrees was valid right that challenge already is is on the verge of being insurmountable in the U.S., right? I mean, it's just like it's easy to see us failing at that, AI aside. Now, when you add a large language models to that and the more competent future version of it, where it's just the most compelling deep fakes are indistinguishable from the real data. Um, and everyone is siloed into their tribes where they're stigmatizing the information that comes from any other tribe. And we're just, and the internet is now so big a place that there really isn't the ordinary selection pressures where, where bad information gets successfully debunked so that it goes away. It's just, you can live in a conspiracy cult for the rest of your life if you want to. You know, you can be queuing on all day long if you want to. And now we've got deep, deep fakes shoring all that up and just spurious you know scientific articles shoring all that up I, all of this just becomes a more compelling form of psychosis and you know culturally speaking and so I, I'm just worried that it's, it's going to get harder and harder for us to cooperate with one another and collaborate um, and that our politics will just completely break and that'll you know offer an opportunity for lots of you know, bad actors 
And I mean, and then leaving aside, you know, there's, there's cyber terrorism and there's there's synthetic biology that you know the moment you get you turn AI loose on on the on the prospect of of uh, engineering viruses and you know all of that, it's like it, it, it potentiates. I mean, the, the asymmetry here is that it seems like it's it's always easier to break things than to fix them or to prevent people, to categorically prevent people from breaking them. And what we have with increasingly pow powerful technology is the ability for one person to create more and more damage or one small group of people. Right? And it was, so it's just... It just turns out it's hard enough to build a nuclear bomb that like one person can't really do it, you know, no matter how smart. You need a team, and you need a, you need it's traditionally you've needed state actors, and you need, you need access to resources, and you, need, you have to get the fissile material, and it's hard enough. But this isn't this is being fully democratized this tech, and so it's um, yeah. That's, I worry about the near term chaos. I've never found the narrow term consequences of artificial intelligence to be that in interesting until now, until right. what you said. That image of like the internet becoming unusable. So that was a real eureka moment for me because I've, I've not been thinking about that. Yeah, no, me too. I was, I was just concerned about the AGI risk. And now, really in the, in the aftermath of Trump and COVID, I, just, I see the risk of... Um, it, if not losing everything, losing a lot that matters, uh, just based on our interacting with just these very simple tools that that are mis reliably misleading us. I mean, I'm just I'm amazed at what social media. I forget about. Well, I'm amazed at what Twitter did to me. I mean, you know, even with all of my training and all, you know, with my head screwed on reasonably straight. I mean, it's, it's amazing to say it, but almost all of the truly bad things that have happened to me in the last decade that just really, like, just destabilized relationships and and just priorities and really kind of got, kind of got plowed back into me. It became a kind of professional emergency, you know, stuff I had to respond to, you know, in writing or on podcasts. It was all Twitter. It was my my engagement with Twitter was the thing that produced the chaos, and it was completely unnecessary. Um, and it was just it was amplifying a kind of signal for me that I felt compelled to pay attention to because I was on it, and I was trying to communicate with people on it. I was getting certain communication back, and it was giving me a picture of the rest of humanity, which I now think was fundamentally misleading, but it was it was still consequential in its. Like I, even believing that it was at a certain point, believing that it was misleading wasn't enough to inoculate me against the delusion of the kind of the, the opinion change that was being forced upon me. Um, and I was feeling like, okay, like these people are becoming unrecognizable. Like I know some of these people. I've had dinner with some of these people, and their behavior on Twitter is is appearing so deranged to me and so in such bad faith. Um, that people are you know, people who I know to be non psychopaths are starting to behave like psychopaths, at least on Twitter, and I'm becoming similarly unrecognizable to them. That it's just again, it, 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 it all felt like a psychological experiment to which I hadn't consented, in which I enrolled myself somehow because it was it was what everyone was doing in 2009, um, and I spent you know 12 years there getting some signal and responding to it uh, and it's not to say that it was all bad I mean I read a bunch of good articles that got linked there and I, you know, I discovered some interesting people but uh, the change in my life after I deleted my Twitter account was so enormous I mean it's embarrassing to admit it I mean it's just it's like it's like getting out of a bad relationship I mean, it's just it was a fundamental um just freedom from from this, this chaos monster that was that was always there, ready to disrupt something based on its own dynamics. And when did you delete it? Um, yeah, like December. I think it was December. I would, and I'm not someone that really takes sides on things. I like to try and remain in the middle. I think politically, yeah, so, I would. So you must have a very different Twitter experience than I was having. No, no, no. 
So I don't tweet yeah. anything other than this podcast trailer. I don't tweet anything else. Right, okay. So I just, the, the only thing you'll see on my Twitter is the podcast trailer. That's it. Yeah. And for all the reasons you've described, and more interestingly, I wanted to say in the last eight months, as someone that tries to be, doesn't get caught up too much in the media, oh, Elon bought this, it, it's 100% gone in that direction. As in, my timeline now is, I say it to my friends all the time, and some of my friends who, again, I think are nuanced and balanced, have said to me, the, there's something that's been turned up in the algorithm to increase engagement that has planted me in an unpleasant echo chamber that I didn't desire mm. to be in. And if I wasn't cog- somewhat conscious, I would 100% be in there. My timeline, I, my friend tweeted the other day, my friend Cackle tweeted, he's never seen more people die on his Twitter timeline than he has in the last six months. They're prioritizing videos, so you're seeing a lot of like death in CCTV footage that I've never seen before. And mm. then the debate around gender, um, politics, right-leaning subject matter has never been more right down your throat. Yeah. Because it's yeah. been, it's almost like something in the algorithm has been switched, where it's now, it's now like people have been let out of the asylum. That's the only way I can describe it. And it's made me mm. retract even more. So when Zuckerberg announced Threads the other, the other couple of weeks ago, it was kind of like a, a life raft right. out, yeah. of this, out of the Titanic. Um, and I really, really mean that. And I'm not someone to get easily caught up in narrative, you know, as it relates to social media platforms. It's been my industry for a decade. But what I've seen on Twitter, and it's actually made me believe this hypothesis I had five years ago where I thought there would be, um, I thought the, route, the the journey of social networking would be, would have way more social networks and they'd be more siloed. I thought we'd right. have one for our neighborhood, our football club, and now I believe that even more than ever. Yeah, that, that seems right. I, I think it, I mean, it's, whether it's possible to have a truly healthy social network that people want to be in and it's a good reason to be there and it's it's uh i don't, I don't know if that's possible uh, i like to think it is but it's um i think there's certain things you you have to clean up at the outset that supposed to make it possible and i think i think anonymity is a bad thing i think um probably being free is a bad thing i think you, you know you sort of get what you pay for online and if it's uh, I just think there, there, there might be ways to set it up that where it would be better, but I don't think it'd be popular. What was I, that? I think with the thing that makes it popular makes it to- toxic. Right, right. And even the anonymity piece, I've played this out a couple of times in my mind, and the rebuttal I always get is, well, there's people in Syria yeah. who have news to break, important news to break, and they, they'd be hung if they. So we need a anonymous version of the social internet. Right. Yeah. Well, that, that, I guess there could be some exception there, but. Um, I don't know. It, it just doesn't. It actually doesn't interest me because I just feel such a different sense of my being in the world as a result of not paying attention to the my online simulacrum. It's, 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 it's a. Um, so, so Twitter was the only one I used. Like I was on, I've been on Facebook this whole time. I've been on, I think, I guess I'm on Instagram too. But like my team just uses those as marketing channels. And it's just like you. It sounds like that's the way you use Twitter now. But Twitter was the the one that I decided. Okay, this is going to be me. I'm going to be posting here. I'm going to, you know, if I've made a mistake, I want to hear about it. You know, it's like, and I just wanted to use it as as actual, an actual basis for communication. Um. And for the longest time, it actually felt like a valid tool in that respect. You know, it, re- it reached a crisis point. I decided this is just pure toxicity. There's just no reason. To, even the good stuff can't possibly make a dent in the bad stuff. So I just deleted it. And then I was I was returned to the real world, right, where I, where I actually live. And to books and to, I mean, I'm, I'm online all the time anyway, but, uh, but it's, not having the it's, it's the time course of reactivity when you don't have social media when you don't when you, and you don't have a place to put this this instantaneous hot take that you're tempted to put out into the world because there's literally no place to put it like if, like for for me if i have some reaction to something in the news i have to decide whether it's worth talking about it in my next podcast that i might be recording you know 4 days from now and rather often, people have been just bloviating about this thing for four solid days before I ever get to the microphone. 
and I ha then I get to think, well, it's still worth talking about. And most, mo almost nothing survives that test <laughs> anymore, right? It's like the, the conversation's moved on. So there's actually no place for me to just type this thing that, you know, that takes me 10 seconds and then rolls out there to get, uh, to, to detonate in the minds of, you know, my friends and enemies to o opposite effect uh, and then I see the the result of all that, you know, on a, uh, again on a this sort of reinforcement loop of every 15 minutes. Um, not having that is such a relief that I just don't even know why I would. So like when Threads was announced, I, I wasn't. I think I'm I'm on Threads too, but it's not me. It's just you know just yet another marketing channel. Um, but yeah, I haven't. I, I feel such relief not exercising that muscle anymore where it's like I, I, you know, I don't know how often I was checking Twitter but it was I was you know I was not checking it just to see what was happening to me or what if it, if the response to my last, last thing I tweeted I was checking it a lot because it was my news feed it's like I'm mm -hmm. following you know 200 smart people they're telling me what they're paying attention to and so I'm fascinated so yeah well yeah I want to see that next article or that next video just that engagement and the endless opportunity to comment and to put my foot in my mouth or put my foot in someone else's mouth or have someone put their foot. It's just not having that has been such a relief that I would be, I mean, it's not impossible, but I would be very cautious in reactivating that because it, it, was, it was so much noise. And again, it, it, it created, there's so much, it, it became a, it became an opportunity cost, but it, it became a just a, this endless opportunity for misunderstanding, but especially misunderstanding of me and you know, everything I've been putting out into the world, and then my sense that I had to react.